Okay. A very warm welcome on behalf of everyone at the Centre for Climate Justice uh, on this beautiful sunny day here in Glasgow um, to this uh, event this morning, Climate Justice and Just Transitions. I'm joined this morning by my colleagues, Dr. Senan Matar and Dr. Michael Mikhailovich, who will help uh, in coordinating and the running of the SMOOTH uh, event today. This event is part of a series of network events supported by the Scottish Government, uh, Scotland's role and contribution in a changing Arctic environment. Within the Scottish Government, we are supported by the head of the Nordic and Arctic Unit at the Directorate for External Affairs. These network events are intended to facilitate specifically collaboration, coordination and discussion amongst Scottish higher education institutions and research organisations on Arctic research and encourage greater engagement with Arctic institutions, particularly the U-Arctic. Despite the strengths of Scottish-based Arctic institutions in Arctic research, many of our institutions and our activities are, we often find, fragmented, leaving many of us unaware of the brilliant work done by colleagues. And it's this very kind of like fragmentation that we want to uh, embrace and harness and to look to see how we can break some of those uh, silos down and work more interdisciplinary in, in, our, in our remits. Through this event, we hope to demonstrate that some of the work through these presentations um, and through our facilitated discussions, how we might advance the Scottish Arctic research so it is much more interdisciplinary. And as part of this, I encourage everyone who's attending this morning to, to voice your ideas and experiences with conducting <clears throat> research. And these ideas and discussions will help formulate uh, follow-up action plans and report through back to the Scottish Government with some recommendations and some good ideas on how we can uh, enhance and foster and enable a more kind of like uh, cross uh, institutional working. So what is the purpose? Why are we actually here? Why are we looking at all of this this morning? Our focus is on the Arctic because of the unprecedented scale of change being experienced in the region. We know that heat waves and wildfires are now frequent when they, are once, when they were once rare. Shrinking sea ice is driving significant ecosystem changes. Unique archeological and cultural records are being destroyed by erosion and decay. Polar communities that have suffered so much in recent generations are facing yet more challenges to their very existence. Scotland, being the Arctic's closest neighbour, is also impacted by these environmental and climate related changes. And with similar interests, we have so much to offer in terms of drawing together multidisciplinary expertise and to discuss critical issues and fostering educational links uh, and developing novel ideas for furthering research and education. So hence this network series uh, today, this morning, um, we will be joined by fantastic lineup of speakers. Um, we will be joined by Professor Volko Rubin, who's Professor of Energy Law um, and International Law and Global Regulation at the University of Dundee. Dr. Daria Shapo Shapovalova, Lecturer in Energy Law and is the co-director of the Aberdeen University Centre for Energy Law. Um, we're, we're really delighted that you're able to, to join us today. Dr. Ta Tavis Potts is Director of the Centre for Energy Transitions and Reader in Environmental Geography also at the University of Aberdeen. And Dr. Senan Matar, who works with us at the Centre for Climate Justice um, and is helping to lead the UArctic, our UArctic thematic network on climate justice in the Arctic. So a warm welcome to all of you. And I'm really, really looking forward to your, your considered insights um, to, to the discussions today. We will be followed by these presentations and overviews from all of our speakers, um, and this will be followed by a discussion um, to look at three specific things. What are the opportunities and barriers to further research in this field of Arctic research? How might this field benefit the lives and well-being 
and resilience of people who live in Scotland and the Arctic in, 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 a, in the global north? And what are the strengths and weaknesses of Scottish research in this field? What lessons are to be learned from Arctic-based institutions? And I think when we're looking at these questions, it's drawing on the huge amount of expertise and knowledge and insight that we have across our Scottish landscape. But by doing so, also being mindful of where we think some of the gaps are in knowledge and how those gaps can be bridged. And I think that is where we would get really good, useful discussions. And it's bringing together the mindsets of people that are working completely opposite polars or in, the, in their uh, respective fields of, of work. So I'm sure it's going to pose for, for great conversation and great discussion. So without further ado, what I would like to do is to invite our first speaker, Professor Volker Rubin, um, to give his um, high level thoughts uh, in, in the direction of travel, what we've set upon uh, this morning. So with that, um, Professor Volker, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is um, uh, it's a great privilege and honor to be to be here with you and uh, speak about this. Uh, I talk with you about this fantastic topic. Um, what uh, I thought I'd start out with is a um, a view of the the potential uh, cooperative fora, really, uh, for. Um, both research and more importantly action in in the uh, in the Arctic, and um, so our our research at the uh, CEPMLP has effectively um, driven this or focused on this particular um, aspect of it, the the governance, if you want to, an international law basis uh, of uh, of action in the Arctic, and that's very interesting because the. Uh, from, a, from a governance and international law point of view, the Arctic is is somewhat different uh, in that it is, of course, uh, water and therefore has a different uh, legal regime from uh, the Antarctic, which is which is land and has a, a, a separate status. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of where you can actually see how uh, the states um, around the Arctic are getting together and finding new ways of uh, cooperatively solving uh, the issues or tackling the issues concerning the Arctic. So that's a very interesting starting point. Um, and uh, it is a it is a, uh, a a work in progress, obviously, but it has it has quite quite substantial com um, potential, particularly because it brings together st states that have very different starting points. Uh, the Arctic Council brings together the, the Nordic states, but also the US and, uh, and Canada and, and, and Russia, of course. So uh, that is a very interesting uh, uh, starting point. And so we, our interest really uh, has been to focus on, uh, first of all, um, the normative question of why states uh, should cooperate and maybe whether there is actually a legal obligation to do so. Uh, and most have focused on the environmental aspect, but we think there's actually also another way of, of looking at this. Uh, and that's from the human rights perspective, uh, because uh, the Arctic has um, a number of uh, vulnerable, vulnerable communities to them. And uh, these are dependent on the ecosystem of the Arctic and uh, their livelihood and their, the conditions of their lives are actually directly threatened by uh, climate change in the Arctic. So that is a uh, a different norm a human rights normative base uh, for um, an obligation on the Arctic states to cooperate. Uh, and that's a very, start, a very important starting point that you don't find in other places uh, so clearly. Uh, and then the Arctic Forum, um, the Arctic Council may be the right forum for that type of cooperation. Now, um, it is not an international organization. It's not as formalized uh, as others, but it has actually already quite a track record at effective effective uh, cooperation that may also be turned towards um, uh, addressing climate change issues. And that was a um, priority of the uh, Icelandic presidency of the Arctic Council. Um, and we'll see what the priorities of the incoming uh, Russian presidency are. Um, but uh, our interest has been to look at 
that potential for cooperation, particularly from an energy transition point of view, which is natural because the CEPMOP has been engaged in energy uh, research for a long time. Um, so the just transition there in that particular uh, region of the world through cooperative uh, means and models of, of working together. Some of them legally binding, but not all of them necessarily. So, uh, and then uh, our interest particularly is in, in a number of, of areas where concrete action can be taken. Uh, the first one would be uh, green energy solutions in, in the Arctic. And that was a priority of the Icelandic, Icelandic uh, presidency. And uh, as we all know, the, uh, the, uh, the energy transition fundamentally depends on uh, shifting away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy forms. Um, and uh, that technological innovation is moving rapidly. Um, but of course, the Arctic conditions uh, have specific challenges for the rollout of uh, renewable technologies that have been uh, successfully uh, tried out uh, elsewhere. Now, one of these interesting things is obviously that we see more and more offshore, deep offshore uh, renewable energy being produced. Um, and that's something that needs to be explored. Um, and also the other issue is obviously the connection, the grid connection uh, or off-grid solutions uh, that can be uh, employed there to each auction, uh, to actually also reach remote areas of the uh, of the Arctic. Obviously, Scotland that is particularly relevant for Scotland because it has uh, emerged as a leader in the wind uh, energy, you know, renewable technology, and um, that's something that needs to be seen and explored in respect of the Arctic. Uh, another area where uh, just energy transitions play a big role is black carbon and methane. Uh, they have black carbon is so generally a, a, a big problem for for the climate and also for health actually. Uh, but they have particular it has particular relevance for the Arctic because it's of look of its localized warming potential um, and the reduction of that um, and the substitution of cleaner energy forms uh, is very is very important. The um, again there are interesting uh, solutions for social change that must underpin, in the spirit of interdisciplinarity that was mentioned, uh, must underpin such changes um, because black carbon actually is often uh, arises from, um, from the use of uh, domestic uh, uh, cooking and heating practices. So that needs to be uh, looked at holistically from the way you can bring about change uh, through social, um, uh, through so social research and different clusters of supply chains, uh, cultural dispositions, um, and of course, political um, impetus have to be considered. That's something we are actually working on uh, actively. Uh, the, a, another third issue broadly in our line of work is the oil and glass, gas explorations in the Arctic. Uh, now that's a huge issue, uh, as, you, as you all know, um, not least because of these uh, enormous reservoirs of, uh, of gas and oil, particular gas, um, in, in the Arctic, uh, as yet un untapped, but potentially the largest in the world. Um, and um, in particular, uh, the, um, it is a very, uh, very hot uh, political issue, as you, as you know, the incoming presidency or the presidency of, this, of Mr. Biden in the, in, the, um, in the US has now stopped explore, exploration in the Arctic wildlife refuge there, um, at least temporarily. Uh, on the other side of the of the Arctic in the in the in Russia, that is going ahead in in a lot to a large scale. And uh, it's interestingly enough that this is very quite a complex issue, not least because uh, that will produce uh, LNG, uh, liquefied natural gas, uh, that will then be used in many parts of the world. And may substitute oil, so it's uh, it's not as as clear as it seems. But clearly, this is an area where uh, the Arctic Council should focus on. It has already one of the few uh, binding international treaties uh, that it adopted concern uh, oil and gas. Uh, in this case, the the safety of it, um, and 
there is, in our view, uh, quite substantial uh, space for research and also uh, transfer of knowledge about environmental impact, uh, environmental impact assessments and other means to keep to keep this uh, the, the environmental uh, impact of that activity uh, somewhat under control. Um, and the fourth issue is the opening up of the uh, Northeast Passage. Uh, it has to do with the oil and gas exploration, but the melting ice means that it is more than likely uh, that the big trade flows from Asia and uh, to Europe will uh, move north from uh, the current the current tr uh, corridor around the um, the, the Suez Canal. Uh, move up for uh, north uh, along the Russian coast and then to to Europe, and that will cut the travel time tremendously. Uh, that has again, you know, a double a double effect. It is uh, obviously it would save fuel and therefore um, uh, ameliorate the emission situation, but put enormous pressure on the Arctic environment, um, and that needs to be looked at very very carefully. Um, it's one of the most important developments. Uh, economically speaking, of uh, the melting ice in the Arctic. Um, and then finally, another issue that is often overlooked, but of great importance, is the issue of legal certainty in the Arctic. Um, this is an area um, where states are very, um, how can I put it, um, jealously guarding their, their sovereignty and their the space of control they have over the waters. Um, and uh, some of these delimitation or some of these uh, jurisdictional lines are uh, not yet delimited. Uh, that is important because it is a basis for cooperation that you first of all know where your jurisdiction ends. Um, and uh, we have ongoing interdisciplinary research uh, assisting states to um, possibly find these delimitation solutions. Uh, in the Beaufort Sea and other places, it is a it is an area of uh, of uh, very intense research uh, at the centre. Um, that's something that probably the Arctic Council can't really agree a, a, a deal with. But um, I wanted to flag this up here because it is uh, of such critical importance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Volker for, for those issues and, and I think you've really touched on some very very challenging and difficult areas there and as you were speaking the thing that really kind of like comes to mind that something that cuts right across the, the issues that you mentioned there is, is around conflict and ba it's that very difficult balancing act between protecting not just our environment but our social communities and and, and people's lives and livelihoods against economic activity um, and growth, which, you know, which all countries are after. So it's it's a real, it's I can imagine it's just huge areas that that you know we're maybe not going to be able to find the right answers to. But I, I think it's it's opening those conversations around around conflict. I think is that will be quite interesting to explore a little bit further. So maybe that comes out uh, in, the, in the discussions uh, as, as we move on. So thank you, uh, uh, Volker, for that. Um, if I could now quickly hand over to, uh, to Daria um, for her, her thoughts uh, on, on the subject. Daria, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dozin. Uh, I'm just trying to share my screen. Uh, is it working? Yes, it is. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Volker, for uh, for your first speech, and thank you very much for for the introduction, Tessine. Uh, my name is Daria Shapovalova. Uh, I work at the University of Aberdeen, um, at the uh, Aberdeen University Centre for Energy Law, where we have uh, sixteen academics and a group of doctoral research students. Uh, fostering research excellence in energy uh, and environmental law, uh, natural resource development. Um, responsible investments and sustainable development law. And uh, we work quite a lot on the uh, Arctic issues uh, and I personally um, work a lot on the Arctic issues. So I would like to uh, raise some of the issues that we are working on um, at the center. And I work on personally um, with the hope that um, some interested researchers uh, around Scotland and, and further away uh, will reach out for potential collaborations. 
Um, we're all aware of the Arctic paradox uh, that while the Arctic uh, warms at a much higher rate than the rest of the world, it is also a place where climate effects are um, particularly present. Um, and it's also a place where quite a lot of fossil fuel uh, resources are located and the fate of those resources uh, will very much dictate the effectiveness of the climate actions that we're taking today. Uh, but something that I see missing from the discourse quite a lot is what you said, Taksin, the role of the Arctic communities and the effects on the Arctic communities of not just these economic activities, but also the lack or the phase out of these um, economic activities. And Arctic is by no means a homogenous region. Arctic is very diverse. Uh, we have a variety of cultures, legal frameworks, a variety of socioeconomic circumstances around the Arctic that need to be taken into account when we discuss the role of the Arctic communities in the energy transition. And in terms of offshore resource development, the coastal communities in the Arctic are not often in a position of decision making. Even in federal states such as Russia, Canada and the US, offshore resources are reserved for decision making purposes um, with the federal governments usually. Uh, but nevertheless, these Arctic coastal communities are often reliant on fossil fuel industry for local development, for employment, including communities such as uh, communities in Alaska. Greenland is very keen to develop its natural resources to improve the socioeconomic circumstances of its people. And not all of the communities in the Arctic, however, are in support of this development. And we see some legal challenges in Alaska and in Canada um, regarding offshore development. And it's very important that any decision making uh, on this issue is transparent, that we have inclusive environmental impact assessment processes, that we have meaningful public consultation processes, especially um, where indigenous people are concerned. But we all need to be very um, attuned to the fact that it's not um, it's not very homogenous what the communities support or are not in support um, of this development and any just transition needs to take that into account. Um, I would also want to note the role of the reliance of the Arctic communities on fossil fuels, not in terms of development, but in terms of consumption. This is something that Folker also uh, alluded to already. Many of the Arctic communities, especially remote communities, rely still on fossil fuels uh, for their own electricity generation and, and heating needs. And the shipments of diesel um, for these purposes are very expensive and, and often quite unreliable and, of course, very dirty because they are associated with black carbon emissions and indoor air pollution um, and quite detrimental health consequences. And there are some excellent examples already of deploying renewables in the Arctic. There are some more creative solutions, which could be questionable for some people, such as the uh, floating nuclear power plants um, in Russia. But um, Scotland is a place where uh, we do have quite a lot of expertise in powering remote communities, powering island communities, and there's quite a lot of excellent research uh, going on in Scottish universities um, not uh, only in law, of course, but in engineering and in social sciences as well. And this is something that I feel we could share and discuss meaningfully. And in terms of Scotland, Arctic and the uh, just transition, I feel like Scotland is making um, very good steps towards acknowledging and developing its just transition framework. Um, there is still, of course, the, way, the long way to go. We have the inclusion of the just transition principles in the Climate Change Act, and we have the just transition uh, commission leading the efforts uh, on consultation about just transition and the recent consultation and all of the responses that have been given to it show quite a lot of concerns that many stakeholders and many communities still have about the um, consequences um, of the climate action taken in Scotland and the fossil fuel phase out, especially in the areas which are dependent on fossil fuel development. And in the Arctic, um, because of the variety of these legal frameworks and political discourses, it will be um, a much bigger and much more difficult effort. Um, and the Arctic Council is an excellent venue for collaboration and facilitating the discussion, and especially with the incoming Biden administration, with hopefully no more denial of climate change as a fact, uh, there will be much more conversations in the Arctic Council about climate change. And in terms of the role of the legal framework, uh, you know, we could talk endlessly about it, but I would just like to highlight some of the challenges and some of the uh, the issues that law could help solve. So first of all, with regards to the fossil fuel phase out, we know that international law cannot force states to abandon the development of their resources, uh, but from the local levels, there is quite already a lot of legal challenges. Um, 
in the US, in the consultation phase, in Norway, in courts, uh, none of them were successful so far, but they do leave quite a lot of scope for regulatory elaboration on issues such as inclusion of the climate effects into environmental impact uh, assessment and responsibility for the export of fossil fuels. Uh, there's an issue of, of course, meaningful engagement and inclusion of local communities in the decision making, particularly of indigenous people, of benefit sharing. And not all of the uh, Arctic states have transparent environmental impact assessment processes at the moment. So maybe this is something that the Arctic Council could facilitate discussions on. Um, there needs to be support for communities in, with regards to sustainable um, energy resources and support for renewable energy development. Um, in the absence of any meaningful avenues for seeking liability for climate change impacts, there needs to be support and some sort of creative solutions for liabilities for communities that are affected by permafrost thaw. 60%, 50% of Canada, 60% of Russia, and 85% of Alaska are covered by permafrost. And we see that with accelerating climate change, the permafrost thaw is already causing quite a lot of structural damage to infrastructure roads, um, causing uh, catastrophes such as the recent uh, oil spill in Norilsk. So so um, hopefully some of the um, expertise that we have here in Scotland will be uh, useful for further collaboration um, with the Arctic at the Arctic Circle um, and within the Arctic Council. And I would just like to share uh, some of the research that, uh, that is happening um, in Aberdeen, some of the relevant projects and publications that are relevant to the Arctic. Um, and the just transition and we are very open for collaboration and we look forward to hearing from any of you who would like to work together uh, on all of the Arctic issues. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Daria, for that. Um, let's see if we can get back to the main slide. Great, fantastic. Thank you. That was that was that was really insightful, Taria. And I think you touched on many of the things that um, that speak to the core of what this particular session is all about: um, climate justice and and just transition. And and the the very very fact that we, we need to be bringing front and centre the voices of those communities who have been affected the most through new, no fault of their own um, and the ones that are going that will end up suffering the most as a result of um, uh, our ch the changing Arctic and with reference to um, the whole justice um, conversation the, the issues that I see coming through are inclusivity, voice, participation and representation so maybe those issues can be taken into the into the group discussion um, uh, slightly later on so thank you Daria for that. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to hand over to Tavis Potts uh, for his um, thoughts on the subject. Tavis are you there? I am here. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, can everybody see that? Okay, I assume. Yeah, you're looking good, Tavis. Go yeah. ahead. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so I just want to bring a, a, a slightly uh, different perspective um, to this to this conversation. I've, I've been working in um, polar affairs for, for 20 years. My, my PhD uh, was actually on the Antarctic at the University of Tasmania, where I looked at, at marine resource conflict in the Southern Ocean. Um, and that's that's really kicked off, a, including a few trips down south, and that's kicked off a, a long love affair with, with the polar regions. And for the past uh, 11 years, I've been teaching uh, in on Svalbard at, at UNIS, uh, the University Institute at Svalbard there. And I want to talk a little about that, that teaching I've been doing, the participatory research and teaching I've been doing uh, in Svalbard. And then draw just a line back to some of the more other uh, participatory research efforts uh, that we were doing in Scotland and how this could potentially inform uh, some activities going forward. Uh, so at the, I'm based on the director of the Centre for Energy Transition here in Aberdeen, and we're engaged in uh, a whole swath of different types of energy research from, from the more physical science and engineering fundamentals through to the legal policy and governance and social aspects of the energy transition. Now, um, that blue arrow uh, is, is pointing to my head and the second row there, I, I was able to attend a number of, of Arctic Council meetings. This is the, 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 
the one I attended in 2013 in Karuna in northern Sweden. Uh, and this was a very interesting experience for me because uh, around the table were, were John Kerry. Uh, he's back again, obviously. Uh, and, and Sergei Lagrov, the, the Russian foreign minister as well, um, over the other side of the table. And, and this is really where I first got my real taste of, of how climate justice uh, works or doesn't work uh, in the Arctic. And the, the Arctic Council has been a superb forum for scientific cooperation and, and, and cooperation between states. But has it really worked for communities and uh, indigenous peoples? And has it really worked in terms of progressing climate justice and the things that, that, that we've just been talking about in, in, in Daria's talk? And I was able to see a real strong challenge to the process by the Sami Council at this meeting, very passionate and plea uh, to work with the communities who, who were essentially receiving considerable cumulative negative impacts from mining uh, in northern Sweden. A problem which continues to this this very day included a recent paper uh, just published in Land Use Policy last year about how the Sami uh, essentially um, 12 or 15 of the, of the major mines are in Sami territory and the, the Sami essentially excluded from the process um, and reindeer herding communities have very weak, weak possibilities to influence the process. So the problems haven't gone away and it gave me a good sense of how how does climate justice work both at a state level? How does it work in terms of, of the institutional level of the Arctic Council? And is that really changing things on the ground? Uh, as mentioned, I've been, I've been teaching for 11 years at UNIS um, on Svalbard, which has been an amazing experience. And the work that I have been doing up there, working with science, science students, uh, Arctic biology, geology, physics and engineering students, has been to run a series of interactive and participatory events, essentially simulating a UN style dialogue over the future of the Arctic and climate change. And this has been a, a really rewarding process over the past 11 years. And it's a, a slightly different style of teaching that we employ in order to try to seed ideas uh, and create interest of scientific students in social and political change. Uh, which I think is a key part of a just transition and is a key part of climate justice, this interdisciplinary and this transdisciplinary work where traditional science students who are never exposed to these ideas can actually take them forward as a part of their careers. So what have I done? Um, we've teach about 25 students to 30 students a year. So I've taught over 275 students over, over 11 years uh, from you know, hard scientific backgrounds. I run a three-day event which consists of material on Arctic politics, climate governance, social science, just transitions. And then we simulate a game essentially over a few days. I get students to form groups from different stakeholder interest groups. So students form groups from different governments, different indigenous groups, different industrial representations. And we try to negotiate an Arctic declaration. Students prepare presentations, negotiating positions, their red lines, and they try to form deals about the future of climate change or energy and or energy development in the Barents Sea. Uh, so essentially, we simulate all elements of a political conference. This is from the, de the formal delegations. Students are, aren't allowed to mix or talk to each other over a few days. They have to stay in their roles, opening statements, corridor negotiations, and a, and a plenary session. Uh, really simulating that feel of what it likes to have to understand and negotiate around a position. So how does this link to climate justice, you might be thinking? Why is this relevant? Well, some of the things I've learned over the decade are, how do you walk a mile in someone else's shoes? How do you understand different perspectives outside your own scientific discipline uh, and understand climate governance from different, different perspectives? So from the perspective of the Sami Council or Greenlandic communities or from industry, operators trying to, to gather influence within the Arctic. We, we try and value and understand local impacts and experience. Uh, community, community resilience and voice are, are, and demands for sovereignty are a key aspect of the climate negotiations and climate justice. So students get a real taste of, of how does this work in practice? It's not a scientific question. It's a, it's a social and a cultural and a political one. So we give them a taste of that. Uh, climate governance is not just a technical exercise as it's often framed. It's social, cultural, political and economic. And I think really importantly, young people and, and, and early career scientists gain a sense of agency over climate action. They feel they can do something in this really big, complicated space. 
And importantly, I think we give young scientists hope. Uh, these are complex problems with many moving parts, but they are problems that can be solved, particularly if you can develop new skills. A lot of the work that I've been doing over the past decade has not been in the Arctic, but has been in the UK, but it does relate to participation, actual participatory research with communities where we get work together with communities to identify challenges and issues around what I call natural capital and how this natural capital is owned and used and how it changes over time and who the benefits and beneficiaries are for that natural capital. And a key thing that we've learned over a decade of doing this work and still pushing it forward and where we can help work with our partners in the Arctic regions, participation really is the engine room of a just transition. Getting people to work together, to understand different perspectives, to have structured processes to, to collate data and also to have a, a good process is really the key aspect of participation at a, at a local scale appropriately designed participatory processes can address issues around the distributional aspects and the procedural and the recognition aspects of, of environmental climate and energy justice. Uh, these are really key important working at this local scale, working across groups and giving community members a real voice in the process of identifying the issues and driving change forward. Climate change will affect people and places, particularly in the Arctic, unevenly. As we've heard, the, the Arctic is not homogenous, it's very heterogeneous. And it's likely to, it will lead to inequalities in there. So participation and participatory research shifts the focus from these homogenous large scale technical or market-based solutions, such, such solutions are sometimes advocated in the Arctic Council, to more nuanced socio-cultural complexities and solutions that work directly for and give voices to communities to change their local environments and systems. Critically, participation is about building trust. That is the key, the, the key currency of a participatory process to build trust both within with your participants, between your participants and between your participants and the problem that they're trying to solve. And I think my work has shown me that participation is inherently local, but participation can scale up to advance climate justice at higher, say, national or even international scales. My final point here is that power should be invested into participatory processes. I'm happy to come back to that point because it's about the ability to change the system. So that's a brief snapshot of the teaching and the research that I've been doing, and I'm happy to speak more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tavis, for that really insightful. And you've been dabbling in this for for many, many years. I can I can see and I can hear that. But I think you've touched on some really uh, uh, fundamental issues. And I think what what really struck strikes out at this is um, that one about beneficiaries and thinking uh, thinking about who is going to benefit from all this uh, wonderful research that we do because at the end of the day it's about um, it's about society and it's about our integrity and it's about building resilience not just for those people who live in in these regions but for future generations as well so I think bringing to heart um, issues of procedural distributive and intergenerational justice are, are absolutely key and 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 really homing in on some of those things um, and the issues of, of co-design and co-developing with beneficiaries at the heart of all the work that we do I think is, is really important but it really strikes that people are the heart of these uh, these conversations and we need to be mindful of, of keeping that uh, front and centre. So thank you Tavis for that. Um, now I'm going to hand over to uh, Senan uh, Matar, who works with me at the Centre for Climate Justice, um, and he's going to say a few words about our thematic network, um, our Arctic thematic network on climate justice in the Arctic. So Senan, over to you. Hey everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to be meeting you this morning and I know some of you have been sort of receiving quite a few emails from me. Um, uh, this is an extremely relevant area of research uh, to Scotland and the Arctic and I'm going to be covering what the, this thematic network is, how it came about and what the future might hold. 
So the thematic network was established last year with the goal to facilitate and enhance interdisciplinary research on climate justice and establish a program of educational exchanges. Uh, as I said, this is an interdisciplinary network made up of researchers with expertise in a, in a broad range of topics such as just transition, uh, climate security and health, if I will name a few. Uh, and so far includes the University of Lapland, Washington, uh, Lab University of Applied Sciences in Finland, and Glasgow Caledonian University through the Centre for Climate Justice with Professor Jaffrey as the network lead. Uh, much of our recent activity has focused on networking and consortium building, uh, such as the webinar on climate justice as an emerging research agenda uh, in June of last year, which I recognize a few names here who attended, um, all of which has been building momentum for a climate justice research agenda in the run up to the Arctic Circle Assembly and COP26. Uh, Talking of Scotland Arctic research, I just wanted to share a few words about the centres and our university's journey to the EU Arctic and the establishment of this thematic network. Uh, GCU, through the years, has established educational partnerships in many of the Nordic nations in the form of student exchanges like the PEATS uh, uh, student exchange programme, promoting employability and transversal skills and joint master programmes such as the Masters in Urban Climate and Sustainability, uh, as well as through Arctic research, uh, uh, notable projects like the Cool Route uh, project, investigating cruising routes and strengthening small and medium enterprises uh, in remote communities, and my centre's uh, Scottish Arctic Policy Mapping Report, uh, just to name a few all of which led to further research and policy collaborations. Uh, a notable mention uh, being our director, Professor Jaffrey and Professor Ibi from the University of Washington, who, who met at the World Forum on Climate Justice and, uh, who, and uh, began the, the, the steps to actually found, found in this Vermessa network. Um, so our center, has been vocal about climate justice and Scotland Arctic research at uh, the Arctic uh, uh, Arctic Spirit Conference and with policymakers at the British Embassy in Helsinki. However, a great moment uh, was the incorporation of climate justice into Scotland's Arctic policy framework uh, based on the uh, Arctic mapping report uh, by our centre and, and the University of Highlands and Islands. And, this, this was very important because the physical changes in the Arctic are a litmus test for climate change. And many of these changes will have catastrophic consequences uh, for the Arctic with fundamental challenges to human security, health, livelihood, sustainable development and biodiversity. Uh, remote Arctic communities and indigenous populations in particular will face the worst of these challenges, despite contributing very little to the problem. Um, the mapping report also explicitly stated there is a fertile institutional ground for much needed consolidation of Arctic research in Scotland. And the, and the Scottish Government's Arctic policy framework draws attention uh, to need to the bridge across institutions in Scotland and the Arctic uh, to achieve this. And, this is certainly the case for climate justice and just transition research in the region. Um, against, this, against this background and building from uh, our online conversations, myself, Dr. Uh, Mikovelovich and uh, Professor McCauley, who I know a few of his colleagues are here today, uh, published a paper on uh, the key debates and a vision for climate justice uh, research uh, in the Arctic. Um, some, some of our findings were social science research in the Arctic has, to some extent, uh, appreciated the inherent inequalities of uh, climate change. How the field is highly fragmented and has yet to match the influence of natural sciences in, in terms of uh, 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 with engagement with policymakers and funding mechanisms. Um, despite this uh, disciplinary imbalance being recognized as a 
a uh, critical gap in knowledge for the Arctic as early as 1989. Um, we also noted research gaps on equity or justice issues in context of adaptation, mitigation, indigenous studies, health, security, and governance. Um, there has been extensive uh, uh, scholarly research on climate justice in other parts of the world, but this has yet to be the case for the Arctic. Uh, but there have been developments, um, including by uh, many of the colleagues here, uh, which has been the exploration of uh, uh, community engagement and participatory research in design and knowledge production, a recognition of justice issues inherent to energy development in regions with marginalized communities, uh, considering of socioeconomic factors uh, when analysis of health impacts of climate change. Um, certainly a shift, a paradigm shift in our understanding of security and governance beyond the traditional focus on uh, uh, borders and defense and more along to climate action and environmental protection. Uh, new discourses on litigation, human rights, as well as the embracing of traditional knowledge of indigenous communities, as, as well as a critical look at the legacies of colonialism and, power, and the power dynamics of who studies the Arctic and the studied. Um, our paper was a, a manifesto for a critical and interdisciplinary research agenda in the Arctic, uh, looking at co-production of knowledge and we argue that climate justice offers to align humanity, social science and natural science researchers to inform policymakers um, on the true costs and real solutions to climate change. Um, this will be incredibly important in the run up to the Arctic Circle Assembly and the COP26. Uh, so this agenda could not be more pressing. And I look forward to speaking with you all today on how we might advance it. Thank you. Thank you, Selin, for that, for giving that, that very brief uh, overview of our journey to, to how we got to our um, thematic network. And I think the things that really spring to mind, uh, and, and it's the last point that, that Selin had, had mentioned there, is who, who studies the Arctic, for what purpose and why? And it kind of like wraps up um, and, and it cross cuts across all the presentations that we've heard uh, this morning about the need to position people uh, at the heart of our, 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 our research and our educational offerings, um, but also for a development kind of like discourse. And it's a good springboard in which to, to launch into our facilitated discussion and, and critically look at how do we start to break down these silos? How do we begin to, 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 to work in a more interdisciplinary way? And I know that it's not that we're not doing it, but I'm, I'm actually thinking, how can we um, uh, enhance um, what, what we do and foster that and, and, and make it a really good anchor for and, and a building blocks for all the work that we do across our, our Scottish landscape?